making employer contact, cold calling to unlock the hidden job market. A presentation written and narrated by David Richardson, employment consultant. We have learned that professional salespeople acquire prospect lists to generate sales leads. They even purchase these lists to acquire the contact information of potential customers. And the emphasis here is on potential because having a prospect list in no way guarantees a sale. But if generating sales is the goal, prospect lists are often essential in achieving this objective. And there are prospect list sources specifically designed for job seekers. A very useful one can be found at America's Career Infinite, the employer locator. This tool assists job seekers to find lists of employers and can be searched by industry, occupation, geographical location, or keyword. Using this tool can give comprehensive lists of employer prospects. As in this case, for businesses offering traveler accommodations. The list goes on for nine pages and provides over 200 businesses within this industry grouping. Marketing prospect lists might be longer, but this list from the employer locator is quite a prospect list for a job seeker. And each entry on the locator's list links to a specific information page containing additional data for that business. The information page entry contains the name, address, zip code, phone number, and even a website when one is available corresponding to that business, everything needed to make employer contact. You can even access a map and directions to the employer's location. Moreover, key contact people are frequently provided, such as Ken Patel in this entry, the owner of America's Best Value Inn on the city's near east side. This resource is a gold mine for job seekers, one that not many people know about or use. But now you have an inside track because you know about it and can use it. But that's not the only source of lists for job seekers. The yellow pages will break businesses up into industry areas providing business names, addresses, and phone numbers. And telephone books also contain zip code directories, all the information you need to make initial contact with an employer. In addition, Manta.com, an internet business information service, is also a source of acquiring business lists and information. So just like a sales professional, you have access to business lists to follow up on in your sales campaign to sell your skills and services to employers. Learning how professionals use prospect lists to market products will help you market yourself. So that's the real question we need to answer. And that is the question. How do professionals use prospect lists? And here's the answer. They follow up on them by mail, by email, or by phone, and sometimes in person in order to market their products or services to the individuals or companies on these lists. Call centers, for example, are professionally staffed phone rooms that employ telephones as a sales tool to attract customers and to create accounts. These centers depend on such lists and their profitability depends on effective follow-up. But what if a prospect doesn't know the seller? In other words, when no previous relationship exists between the salesperson and the prospect prior to the contact. When this is the case, this sales technique is called cold calling. And if you're trying to contact employers to set up interviews, even in response to job ads, that's also pretty much what you are doing. And sometimes this can be frustrating. But a simple step can help us avoid a lot of unnecessary frustration and maximize our results. Let's learn to do cold calling professionally. But first, let's check a few facts. Let's see how similar your call to the employer is to a sales cold call. Remember, as we mentioned, an individual on a prospect list is simply that, a prospect. There is no guarantee for a sale. In the first place, a prospect in a cold call typically has no idea that the salesperson making the call has anything he or she might find interesting or might want. So it's uphill for the salesperson at the very start of the call. 
getting the prospect's interest and attention is a major challenge. If the prospect's interest and attention cannot be engaged, then no sale will be made. It's that simple. So how about your call to an employer for a job? Does the employer know that you have skills that he or she might want? Probably not. And there is a similarity. So check. And here is the second thing. Perhaps you have been interrupted at home during dinner or during some important activity or project by a sales call from a call center. How was your response to the call once you discovered its purpose? Though I am sure you wouldn't do something like this, actually some people, if you can believe it, respond with a bit of irritation or even worse toward the salesperson. Imagine that. And why does this happen? Well, the prospect has other things to do. That's why much more important things to do, at least in the prospect's opinion, than to talk with a salesperson. So, to the prospect, the telephone call attempting to sell windows or vacation timeshares or whatever is simply an irritating interruption. This, of course, is a negative for the sale, something the salesperson must overcome before a sale can be made. And what about the employer? Even if you are responding to an advertised ad, the employer still has to handle the day-to-day -day responsibilities of the job. They won't go away. Interviewing candidates for an open position is simply added to the employer's plate as something else to do. Moreover, most supervisors really don't like interviewing job candidates. In fact, they tend to hate it. It simply gets in the way of what they take their real jobs to be, managing their departments but they also know it needs to be done and they would like to get it over with as quickly and effectively as possible because they have other things to do. So when you contact an employer about a job opening you're facing the same problem as the telemarketer reaching you during dinner. The telemarketer wants you to complete a telephone survey but you want to finish your fried chicken before it gets cold. Similarly, when you call the employer to ask for a job interview the employer is handling a whole raft of different activities that need to get done. And your request is simply one more thing to add to the list. Do you see the similarity to a sales cold call? Another check. A third characteristic of a cold call is the issue of trust. No relationship exists between the prospect and the salesperson, so no foundation has been laid for any kind of trust. In fact, Prospects know that a salesperson wants their money. That's the purpose of the call. So why should a prospect trust anything a salesperson says? That's yet another challenge to the sale. Unless the prospect trusts the salesperson enough to honestly process a check or credit card, no sale can be made. So a cold call must invite trust, or it simply won't be successful. And what about the employer? Does the employer have any reason to believe what you say about your skills and abilities? Or does he assume that you will say anything that you think might get you the job, whether that might be true or slightly less than true? Employers are going to be skeptical, as skeptical as any prospect responding to a cold call. Get used to that. You would respond in the same way. So does your presentation in this way match a cold call? You bet it does. So, check. Finally, a sale is a buying decision. The prospect must choose to purchase a product or service from the salesperson. In sales jargon, that's a matter of overcoming sales resistance, the natural inclination of prospects to keep their money in their pockets or purses, rather than to purchase something from a stranger that they might regret buying later. That's why professional salespeople make use of guarantees and such offers as return the product in 30 days for a full refund, no questions asked. These strategies, along with post-purchase aftercare programs, encourage customer satisfaction with the company, even if the customer later decides to return the purchase. The customer will usually retain positive feelings for the company because of the generous return policy and retaining these positive feelings is essential to making future sales. 
so relieving any anxiety a prospect might have over potential buyer's regret simply makes sense to encourage the buying decision, both now and in the future. Hiring an employee is just as much a purchasing decision because employees cost money, for example, salary, insurance, taxes, social security, and so forth. Might the employer also fear developing buyer's regret after hiring you? And could this anxiety about potential disappointment with a candidate's future performance actually interfere with the hiring decision, causing the employer perhaps to postpone the decision? That's yet another check. These are but a few of the similarities between a sales cold call and your employer contact call, but they are the critical ones for our purpose. Both the prospect and the employer don't know what the seller has to offer or whether or not they want it, and in the hiring process the seller is you and the employer is your customer. Both the employer and the prospect have other things to do, and you, along with the salesperson, can be seen as an interruption or interference in important activities. Both the employer and prospect lack trust, because no foundation has been laid for it, either in a cold call or in a call to ask for a job interview. And finally, both fear having buyer's regret. The prospect, reluctant to make a buying decision about a product he or she may later regret purchasing. The employer, fearing to hire an employee who doesn't work out, and then having to start the hiring process all over again. So what's our conclusion? A cold call and your employer contact call are pretty much the same. Though on the surface they may seem different, the one is pretty much like the other and both are about making a sale. So if we're going to be effective making employer contact, then we need to approach the challenge as a professional salesperson handles prospect leads. That approach will improve our chances for success. So let's remember the issues. To restate them, one, the employer doesn't know what you have to offer. Two, the employer has other things to do. 3. The employer lacks trust, and 4. The employer fears buyer's regret. Though these cannot be fully addressed during the initial contact, they really don't have to be. What we have to do is address them sufficiently so that the employer feels interested and comfortable enough to offer the job interview. At the interview, you will have a better chance to explain what you have to offer, generate trust, and allay buyer's regret. But if you never get that interview, you'll never get that chance. So at this point, winning a job interview opportunity is the major objective. So we need to learn a good strategy for improving the odds of getting that interview appointment. And the best way to come up with that strategy is to think like sales professionals. So let's see how we can address these issues in our employment campaign from a sales point of view. How do we convey the right message that we have the skills and experience the employer needs and wants? And how do we get that message to the right person, the one who has the power to say, you're hired? And how do we find that person in the first place? Next, how do we make an attractive and effective initial presentation to the employer, one that avoids the negative response, you're bothering me and wasting my time? In other words, how can we generate enough interest to make employers actually want to meet with us to learn what we have to offer? Third, what can we do to encourage the employer's trust? Distrust will certainly kill our chances for being hired, and that seems to be the default position. So how can we turn this around, at least enough to get the job interview? And finally, how do we address the issue of buyer's regret? That is, what do we do to give employers enough confidence that we are quality candidates and well worth interviewing, that offering that interview appointment is a good decision, one they're not likely to regret? These are the four major issues we need to address in order to make our cold calling for employment effective at producing job interviews. And here is our plan, step by step. One get the hiring authority's name and contact information. Two, 
send an employment packet that catches the eye and makes a powerfully intriguing impact. 3. Target your resume's billboard to exactly match the employer's need. 4. Talk and dress in a way that fits the employer's image of the effective employee. And this isn't just about clothing and verbal communication. Make any written materials you send also match that image by how it sounds and looks. Properly punctuated, well organized, neat, and formatted attractively. The first issue is a matter of getting our message to the right person. That bullseye is typically not human resources. Rather, it will be the supervisor who supervises the department in which we want to work. For example, if I want to work as a certified nursing assistant, who might be the supervisor of that department? Answer, the director of nursing, the DON. Let's say that you want to work in customer service. Then the supervisor or director of customer service is the person you are looking for. Get the idea? The hiring manager you are looking for you can identify by job title simply from the department in which you want to work. Who hires construction workers on a building project? Typically the project supervisor usually called the superintendent. That would be the person to get your message to. Now we're going to find the actual name of the hiring authority but the first step in doing this is to identify that person by job title. So ask yourself the question what is the job title of the person who hires an applicant like me? Or what department do I want to work in? The supervisor of that department is the person you are looking for. Once you have this you can take the next step. And here is that next step. Simply use a professional telemarketing script like this one as a tool to turn your very basic research about the employer into the actual name of the hiring authority, the person you need to direct your message to. Don't worry about human resources. You can always send your resume and application there, and I urge you to do that as well. But getting to the person who can actually hire you will prove more effective, and the professional script will help you do it with greater confidence. To use this script, simply insert each identified item of information in the blanks provided. This information you will have immediately available, such as your name, or you can get easily from your research on the company. The first blank asks for your name. Put that down both first and last. Let's say your name is Tyrone Majors. You want to work at International Distribution in the Customer Service Department. So the job title of the hiring authority is going to be supervisor or director of the customer service department. That's the person you are looking for. How hard is that? You've looked up the address using one of your tools, say the phone book, and found the address to be 1327 East Washington Street. The zip code you have matched with this business is 46209 you're going to request the exact spelling of the person's name which will also give you that name but since you don't know it yet simply insert the job title to identify that person in the question would you please give me the correct spelling of the customer service supervisor's name and of course you have put in the phone number from the phone book 317-568-1236 the remaining items the person's actual name the extension number and fax number are items you're probably not going to have but you will soon be getting them because you're ready to use the script just call the company's general number to talk to a receptionist you may have to contend with an automated systems phone tree but be patient you will eventually get to a receptionist let's see how mister majors might use this script to get the information he needs from international distribution Good morning, International Distribution. Julie here. How may I help you? Hello. My name is Tyrone Majors. I have a packet of material to send to the customer service supervisor. Would you please help me to verify my information? I have your address listed as 1327 East Washington Street. 
Yes, Mr. Major, that's correct. Would you also verify your zip code? I have 46209. Yes, sir, that's correct. One final question. Would you give me the correct spelling of the customer service supervisor's name? That would be Anne Fulbright, A-N-N-E-F-U-L-B-R-I-G-H-T. Your telephone number I have listed as 317-568-1236. Is there a number or extension that I should call to verify that Ms. Fulbright has received the packet? Her extension is 5466. Thank you. And could you give me the appropriate fax number? Our general fax number is 317-568-12. Thank you. You've been very helpful. I appreciate your time. Thanks again, and you have a nice day. Let's look into Mr. Major's mind to see what he's thinking to better understand how this technique works. Please note, as he used the phone script, he did not ask to talk with anyone. Though he now has Miss Fulbright's extension, he's not going to bother her, not just yet. She doesn't know him. She has no idea what he can offer or whether she's even interested. That's issue number one, remember? Moreover, he doesn't want to interrupt or inconvenience her. She might feel that he's wasting her time, and that might generate both a negative impression as well as a negative response. That's issue number two. Moreover, if he manages to get through to her now and ask for a job interview out of the blue, she will probably refer him to human resources. Mr. Majors knows this, so he's not going to do that either. Instead, he's going to build a bridge. He's going to create a reason for Ms. Fulbright to talk with him, a reason that will allow him to ask for a job interview and also improve his odds of getting a positive response and avoiding a negative reaction from the person he wants as his next supervisor. To build this bridge, he's going to send Ms. Fulbright a fax, which will include his resume. And here is the address section of his fax cover sheet, which sports a little graphic interest, a telephone with a written page of information emerging from it, symbolizing a fax message. With the information that his research and phone call has given him, he now has Miss Fulbright's exact name, spelled correctly, and business contact information. Miss Ann Fulbright, Customer Service Supervisor. The company, of course, International Distribution, located at 1327 East Washington Street, Indianapolis, Indiana, zip code 46209, and the fax number is 317-568-1239. In the box directly below, he has typed his own contact information, Mr. Tyrone Majors, 1232 Bell Court, Indianapolis, Indiana, 46218, along with his phone number, 317-123. 4567. In the graphic box emerging from the phone, he has typed the subject of the fax, customer service specialist position, the job he would like to get. He has also included the date, July 13, 2012, and below the date, the total number of pages in the fax, three pages. Just below, on the bottom half of the sheet, he has written a brief cover letter, a sales message to Miss Fulbright requesting an interview and highlighting two ways of contacting him, phone and email. And here it is, again below the date in the remarks section. And here is how the message reads, quote, As you requested, I am faxing my resume to be considered for the above reference position that you currently have available. This position matches my skills and experience. In addition, it is the kind of work I really enjoy doing. I would appreciate a personal interview to discuss how my skills would meet your needs. To contact me to set up an interview, please call me at 317-123-4567 or you may email me at tyronemajors at yahoo.com. Thank you for your attention. I look forward to hearing from you soon." Unquote. And please note that he has repeated in this message his phone number from the address line above and he has added his email address. Both methods of contact presented in a highly visible way to draw attention. 
Now let me point out something about the message. Look at the first line. It says, quote, as requested, I am faxing my resume to be considered for the above reference position that you currently have available, unquote. Now, Mr. Majors may not be certain that there is any available position at all, but he's going to assume that there is. That's the only assumption that makes any rational sense to make, else there would really be no purpose in sending the fax to begin with. So unless you know for certain about an available position, your fax to an employer, like Mr. Major's fax, will be something like casting a fishing line. And that's okay. Using bait and tackle is one way to catch a fish. In addition, since he's just learned the name of the person to whom he's sending his fax, how does he get away with saying that his resume was requested? No one has asked him for anything. This is not a mistake. It's on purpose. He is assuming standard operational procedure here. What does that mean? Well, if you apply for a job at international distribution or at virtually any company, what will be requested? Your resume, of course. Since Mr. Majors is seeking employment with this company, international distribution, he is simply noting what he knows the policy must be and is complying with it before being directly asked. But Ms. Fulbright at International Distribution, who is reading this message, may assume that Mr. Major's resume has been specifically requested. By writing in this way, he has given Ms. Fulbright a reason to look more carefully at the resume. The marketing technique he is using is one designed to get a sales prospect to pay closer attention to promotional materials. Mr. Majors is using the technique to induce the potential employer to take a closer look at his resume. An example of this technique might be a promotional letter from a car dealership that includes a coded car key. The letter explains that the dealership is having a special celebration and invites the recipient to come in for the party. Hot dogs, burgers, chips, soda, door prizes and the like. And then goes on to say that there's a special giveaway. The promotional letter tells the prospect that the included coded key may open the locked door of a brand new car. And if it does, the prospect can simply drive the new car away, free and clear. Just come into the dealership to give it a try. So the car dealership is using the possibility of winning a new car to induce the prospect to actually read the promotional material and perhaps come onto the lot by free choice to get a burger and possibly a free car. Nothing to lose and it's a free lunch. And while there, the prospect will see the new model cars and be available to the car lot salespeople. And that might produce a sale. After all, if the prospect isn't on the lot, there can't be a sale. Inducing the prospect to come in simply improves the odds. That's why car dealerships run these kinds of promotions. Mr. Major's fax message uses a less dramatic form of this technique. No hot dogs or burgers here but he's still using a psychological incentive, the possibility that he has already been asked to submit his resume. He's hoping that this will be enough to induce Ms. Fulbright to take a special look at it, by her own choice. If she does, the resume will serve as his professionally dressed sales pitch to show what skills he has to offer in a way that targets the supervisor's needs, to pique her interest, and to build the bridge that will enable him to ask for that job interview with better odds of getting it. To make employer contact, Mr. Majors is applying in his job search the very technique used by ABC Motors to reach potential car buyers, and it's one that works. It gets the employer's attention, projects a professional image, conveys skills such as creative problem solving, and gives the employer sufficient reason to take a chance on offering this applicant an interview appointment. In short, it addresses all four of the issues we need to address. Remember what these are? 1. The employer does not know what we have to offer. Mr. Majors has sent a summary, his resume, in a way that gives a reason for the employer, Ms. Fulbright, to pay closer attention, to actually read his resume. 2. The employer has other things to do. Mr. Majors is creating a narrative for himself designed to get the employer to look at the resume by her own free choice. 3. Trust. The creative approach works to persuade the employer to take a chance on offering Mr. Majors an interview appointment. There, he can address the trust issue more directly and effectively. And finally, 4. The employer's image of the effective employee. 
Mr. Majors is using his professional method of contact along with confidently written documents to match that image and pique the employer's interest. Mr. Majors sends his fax and waits a day or two. He then calls the company back. He will now use the phone contact information he has from his Fulbright to attempt direct contact. And if he has to go through the switchboard again, he'll say that he's checking to see if a packet of material has been received. What packet? The resume and cover letter, of course, but the receptionist doesn't need to know that. That's not really the receptionist's concern. So when the receptionist answers, Mr. Majors might say something like this. Good morning, International Distribution. Julie here. How may I help you? Hello, Tyrone Major is here. May I speak to Ms. Fulbright in customer service, extension 5466? I'm checking to confirm if a packet of material has been received. And what will the receptionist do? Connect him, of course. Mr. Major's business with the supervisor sounds official, and he's confident. And if the receptionist does ask what the packet pertains to, Mr. Major's response would be that it is a packet of materials being sent to a number of customer service supervisors in the area which would certainly be true because he's following up on a prospect list of customer service employers a list he developed using tools that we've also learned to use in this workshop so once he's gotten through to Ms. Fulbright's office he will introduce himself and reference the packet cover letter and resume if he only reaches Ms. Fulbright's answering machine he'll leave his message phone number and a request for return call if he speaks to her directly he'll ask for an interview appointment opportunity if Ms. Fulbright says yes, then he'll request a date and time for the appointment and put the job interview on his schedule. If she says no, then he will get on with his next follow-up call. His mission, like yours, is to generate job interviews, not to focus on employers who say no. And once the employer who interviews him also hires him for a job, he won't remember the businesses that said no anyway. He'll be too busy getting started in his new job and earning a living. Now isn't that what you want for your future as well? A job that earns a living and keeps you busy enough to forget about those employers who might have said no to you in the past. Well, if you do, then use a professional strategy, one that marketers use to achieve their sales targets. That will help you achieve your career goals with greater confidence, organization, purpose, and success. We have shown you an effective strategy, one that others have used to find careers for themselves. Now it's up to you. The power is in your hands. A job is waiting for you, and you need to begin looking for it. So let's get started, and best of luck in your career search. Until next time, this is David Richardson for Making Employer Contact, cold calling to unlock the hidden job market, saying thank you for watching, and goodbye.